Praise God. Let's turn this evening, please. We want to read together in Matthew's Gospel, and we're right back in chapter 1. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. This is a Christmas reading, of course. We're just a week or two away from Christmas. We're maybe a week early with this, but nevertheless, it will do us good, God willing, to, to just to consider some of the things that we see here. We're going to begin in Matthew chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 18, please, of that chapter. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother, Mary, was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Can I just clear up something in that reading for you for just a moment or two? You will notice there, verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together. Okay, look at verse 19. It says, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. Okay, and then down in the last verse, sorry, verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. Can I make something very clear? They were espoused. They were not married together at that time. Although Joseph in verse 19 is called her husband, can I just explain very simply, as far as the tradition was concerned, as far as, you know, Judaism was concerned, they were espoused one to the other. In the eyes of the community, they were as good as married, although they had not actually been married at that time. It's just to clear up any confusion, because it talks about him being espoused, or her being espoused. Then in verse 19, it talks about Joseph being her husband, and down in verse 25 and 26, sorry, verse 24 and 25, it speaks about how Joseph took on to him his wife. They were espoused. It was the same as what we hold as our engagement period. Whenever a couple are engaged to be married, but as yet they aren't married. But in the eyes of the community at that time and in that culture, they were as good as being married. You know, friends, there's something tremendous about Christmas. Something I believe that we have lost so much of whenever we think about Christmas, especially in connection. You know, you turned on the Christmas lights in Balamini here the beginning of November. What's that like, huh? And we've lost so much of the I was going to say the magic. Magic's the wrong word, but the mystery of what Christmas really is and how good Christmas really is. You know, Christmas, that first Christmas that we have read about in our our story this evening, it was a miraculous time. Miracles are a subject that everybody wonders about. Everybody. Many people question if miracles still really happen today or were they just something that happened, you know, in Bible times or happened a long time ago, maybe for a, for a certain time period. And today, perhaps, the whole miraculous thing has passed away. Let me just say that maybe you've had occasions in your own life whenever you 
hoped for a miracle because at that particular time, perhaps, you could certainly have done with a miracle. And maybe it didn't come or maybe it didn't happen. But friends, I am convinced that whenever you read the Scriptures, I am convinced that miracles still do happen today. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Praise God, he still has the power. God still is a miracle-working God. And he's working miracles, I believe, in the world practically every single day. Can I say this tonight? Whenever a miracle does occur, one thing that is certain is that those who experience the miracle, praise God, will be changed by it. That's the glorious thing about it. Miracles can change our world. Miracles can change history. And as I've said, whenever you look at the Christmas story, it's a miraculous time. There are a number of miracles that surround the story of that first Christmas. And that's what I want to look at for just a few moments tonight before we draw our service to a close. Miracles connected with Christmas, or the miracle of Christmas. The first one is quite simply this. The miracle of who came at Christmas. You see, Christmas is a celebration of an invasion. I don't know whether you've ever looked at it like that or not, but that's what it is. It's a celebration of an invasion. You know, I can remember whenever I was much younger than what I am now, I can remember the first time that they managed to get an Apollo spacecraft to the moon. Many of you will remember that. You're going to show your age, but that was back in the, was that back in the 60s, I think? You know, and Neil Armstrong was the first man to walk on the surface of the moon. And I can remember, you know, the pictures were beamed at that time and you had to sit up to way up to the middle, into the middle of the night, the early hours of the morning, if you wanted to see it. And the pictures weren't terribly clear and they were black and white and all of that, you know. But there was tremendous interest and excitement whenever man set foot upon the surface of the moon. Friends, listen to me. Christmas is about God invading earth. God comes and he sets foot. He is born into this earth. And so Christmas is a celebration of an invasion. Now you might say tonight, God, I thought Christmas was about Jesus Christ. I was going to say there, I thought Christmas was about Santa Claus, but we know he's not, it's not about that really. I thought Christmas was about Jesus Christ. But friends, the Bible says that Jesus is God. Let's make that very clear tonight. Let's not have any doubts about that. Jesus is God. And throughout his lifetime and throughout his death and his resurrection, Jesus proved that he was indeed God incarnate, the Bible calls him. Emmanuel is what we read here. God with us. Listen to Colossians chapter 1. It says in verses 15 and 16, Christ is the exact likeness of the unseen God. He existed before God made anything at all. And so we've got to get that very clear tonight. Jesus Christ is God incarnate. God in human flesh. In fact, Christ himself, the Bible tells us, is the creator who made every single thing around us in heaven and on earth. The Bible says Jesus Christ created this world. Jesus didn't just start at that first Christmas time. He didn't just start whenever he came as a babe to be laid there in Bethlehem in that manger. While what we celebrate at Christmas is not the beginning of Jesus Christ, but what we celebrate is the day that he came into this world. But he is from everlasting, praise God, unto everlasting. Now many people, of course, they look at the Lord Jesus Christ in various ways, in different ways. Some believe he was a good man. Some believe he was a good teacher. But let me say tonight, Jesus never claimed to be any of those things. He never claimed to be any of those things. This is what Jesus said. John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 13. Speaking about the Father, speaking about God. Jesus said, we are the same. The Father and the Son, Jesus says, He is in me 
and I am in him. Now, friends, whenever you consider that statement tonight, Jesus was either a con man, or he was a liar, or he was a lunatic, or else he was exactly who he claimed to be. And you see, tonight, that puts a tremendous responsibility upon you. Because you've got to determine tonight, was he a liar? Was he a con man? Or was he a lunatic who got so confused that he ended up nailed to a cross? Or was he really God in the flesh? Because listen to me, if he was God in the flesh, then dear one, it's time that you began to take heed of what Jesus had to say. And so it puts a tremendous responsibility upon each one of us this evening. You see, I'm asking in connection with that, where do you stand with God? If Jesus is God, if Jesus is God incarnate, if Jesus is God's Son, if Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in Jesus, then what have you done with what Jesus has told you to do in your life? And so we celebrate Christmas. And that's the first miracle. The miracle of who it was who came at Christmas because it was an invasion that God made upon planet Earth. That's the first miracle. God himself came to planet Earth. You know, even our calendar is set by this. You know, we speak about B.C., so many years B.C., before Christ. We speak about so many years A.D., Anno Domini. Every day that we live, The date makes reference to God's coming to Mother Earth. And many people say, I don't believe in God. And yet every single day uses Jesus as a reference point to work from in the calendar. That's how important this is. God came to Earth. That's the first miracle. The second miracle is simply this. How he came to Earth. What a miracle that is. What a mystery that is. You see, it doesn't start out in some flashy way. Instead, when the fullness of time was come, the Bible tells us, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. God himself became a man. John says, the Word became flesh, He dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Philippians says, he gave up his place as God. This is paraphrased. He gave up his place as God. He made himself nothing. He was born to be a man and became like a servant. And when he was living as a man, he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see, friends, this is how God chose to demonstrate that there is a God. This is how God chose to demonstrate. He became one of us. And Jesus said continually, if you want to see God, he says, take a look at me. He says, if you want to hear God, he says, listen to me. I only speak what God the Father tells me to speak. I only do what God the Father tells me to do. Listen, God could have written it in the sky that there is a God. And people would have believed that if they had seen it. God could have used thunder and lightning because people would say, well, he's God and he must have power. And so he could have done it that way. But instead, he came into this world the same way that you and I came into this world. As a baby. Why did he do that? Because, friends, Jesus came into this world to save us. Listen to me. Not to scare us. Not to scare us, but to save us. You see, who really is afraid of a tiny child? Huh? You see, many people are afraid of God. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) Many people are afraid of God. But who's afraid of a child? 
Many people don't like you talking about God. Many people don't like you talking about eternity that's in the hand of God. Many people don't like you talking about the judgment that lies ahead with God. Because people are afraid of God. Adam and Eve were afraid of God. The moment they sinned and God came to speak to them, as was his custom to do, Every day, he came and communed with them in the garden. But because of the sin in their lives, they said, whenever they heard his voice, they ran and hid themselves because they were naked. They were afraid to face God in the condition that they found themselves. They had broken his law. They had sinned. And for you and for me, so many people in sin are afraid to come into contact with God because of what that sin is. Because of that sin that's in their heart and in their life. And some people, even whenever you talk about it, they get nervous. Whenever you talk about these things, about judgment and about sin and about hell and about those things that God holds completely in his hand, people get nervous and people get afraid. If he had come in thunder and lightning, it would have scared most people. You know, there are people terrified, alive on the world today, And whenever they look at some of the things that are happening across the globe, some people are living practically terrified, wondering what's coming next, or wondering, is this next going to be the end of it all? Terrified. But you see, friends, he came as a little child because he wants us to know him. He knows all about you. He knows all about me. Every single thing that has ever happened to you He's watched every single moment of your life. Every moment. He's listened to every single word that you've ever said. He formed you, the Bible says, in your mother's womb. He watched your birth. He watched you grow. He knew whenever you took your first step. He heard whenever you spoke your first word. He watched every single moment of your life. And he knew a thousand years before this world was ever created, he knew that you would be sitting in this meeting tonight in this church building. And he came as a child and was laid in a manger because he wants you to know him. Because he's interested in your life. He's interested in how you live your life. He's interested in the things that trouble you in life. And dear one, listen to me. He's interested about where you will live eternity after you end this life. He's interested in you and in me. And so he came as one of us. And he came that way to communicate to us in a way that we could understand. He was born like us. He grew up like us. He was tempted, the Bible says, like us. He had the same needs as we have. He had the same desires. He had the same drives. He had the same problems in his life that you and I face in our lives. He faced the same pressures that you and I face in life. And the reason that he went through all of that, God, yet going through all of that, the reason he went through all of that was so that he could relate to you and he could relate to me. In your life, in your heart, in your situation, no matter what you are going through, he knows, he understands, and he cares because bless his holy name, he has been there. You know, we say today, been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. Isn't that right? He has done that. He has walked on this scene of time. He experienced real pain. He knew what it was to be tempted. He suffered exactly as we do. He experienced these things. There were times whenever Jesus was lonely. Have you ever been lonely? There were times whenever he was lonely. There were times whenever he was tired. Have you ever been just, you know, completely overcome with fatigue? There were times whenever he was tired. There were times whenever he was under tremendous pressure. 
Listen to me. There were times whenever he was disappointed. There were times whenever he was misunderstood. There were times whenever he was criticized. There were times whenever he was treated wrongly. Just like every one of us. And he bore it all gladly. Because he came to identify with us. To understand how we live. To understand how we think. To understand how we live our lives as we journey through this lifetime. What a miracle. God became man. Listen, friends, we'll never understand that one. We'll never fully get to the bottom. How do you put all of God, the God that's bigger than the universe, how do you put all of God into a human body, especially the body of a little child? What a miracle. God became man. He became like us so that he could understand us and so that we could understand him. Have you ever asked, why am I here? Have you ever asked, is there any real purpose in life? Have you ever really considered, where do I really come from? Where am I going to? What's the significance of life on this planet? Is there a purpose really to life? And you see, friends, all of that can be answered in one sentence. The Bible says, you were made to be loved by God. And that makes life so important. That gives life all of of the significance that it needs. God made you, dear one, listen to me, just to love you. And if you miss that truth, if you miss that glorious truth, you miss the whole purpose of life itself on this scene of time. And sadly tonight, sadly so many people do miss that. And they live life without ever having a relationship with this wonderful God and this wonderful Savior. But what a miracle. He came as a child so that we wouldn't be afraid of him. He came as a human being so that he could relate to us. And next, I want us to think for just a moment of the fact that he came to ordinary people. Oh, he's king. In fact, he's king of kings and he's lord of lords. But he came to ordinary people, not just a select few or not just to a chosen class or a privileged class, not just to a religious people, but first of all, he came to lowly shepherds. Can I tell you something about shepherds? We were thinking about the culture of that time at the beginning of our thoughts tonight. Let me tell you something about shepherds just for a moment. Do you know that in society, in that culture, shepherds were the zeros in society? Shepherds were looked down upon. They were scorned. They were the very lowest that you could have in society. They were classed practically as nobodies. And they were frowned upon and they were looked down upon. But Jesus, I love this, he was born in a stable. He was born amongst the animals. Friends, it doesn't get much more lowly than that, does it? Right down, right down where the zeros, right down where the nobodies have their main existence. And the shepherds were the first, the Bible tells us, to hear the news that he had come. Later on, whenever you go through all of the stories, later on and some time later on, the Bible tells us that wise men, they brought precious gifts from the east. And this all, this all shows it's from the highest to the very lowest. You see, friends, thank God tonight, he's available to every single one of us. And I don't care tonight what your background is. And I don't care tonight what background you have come from. And I don't care tonight what you have done in life. Praise God, he is available to every single one of us. Hallelujah. And that's why he came. And was born and laid in that lowly manger. He wasn't born up on some hill where we can't get to him. No, friends, he was born. He was born into a little community in the very lowest in society. Or those that were classed as the lowest society. And praise God, anybody can come and have a relationship with him. You see, tonight, that tells me 
that God meets us exactly where we are. He meets us exactly where we, whatever we are. God meets us exactly there. What a miracle. Bless his holy name. And then finally, let me just throw the last at you very quickly. The miracle of why did he come? And friends, what a miracle this is. You see, tonight, praise God, he came for our benefit. For our benefit. He came for you, and he came because of me. Listen to how the Lord Jesus Christ himself explains this. John chapter 18, verse 37. Jesus says, I was born for this purpose. I came to bring truth to the world. Let me give you another verse. John 10, verse 10. I came to give you life, and life more abundantly, in all of its fullness. John 12, verse 48, Jesus said, I came to save the world, not to judge it. That's how Jesus explains why he came. He came to bring us truth. He came to give us life. And praise God, he came to give us forgiveness. That's what those three verses tell us that I've just quoted to you. That's, listen to me, that's God's Christmas gift to this world. That's God's Christmas gift to you. If you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, here's his gift. Let me give it to you again. Truth. Jesus said, I was born for this purpose I came to bring truth to the world. Life, Jesus says, I came to give you life and life more abundantly in all of its fullness. Forgiveness, Jesus says, I came to save the world, not to judge it. Friends, that's God's Christmas gift to your life and to your soul. He says, that's why I came. To bring you the truth, the truth that God loves you, and to bring you the truth, to show you the truth about yourself. You need God. You need that sin dealt with. Just as Adam and Eve were separated from God, you are separated from God, and only Jesus can sort that out for you. And he came to give us the truth of God's love, and he came to show us the truth about ourselves. Truth about life. Because there are a lot of philosophies in life, and they're completely useless. But here's truth. Let me give it to you again. God loves us, every single one. And he gave his only son. And we need him. And life is meaningless and life is wasted if we miss him. You know, I love that verse Jesus says, you will know the truth. And the truth, praise God, shall set you free. He came to bring you truth. God loves you. He sets us free to really live like God meant you and me to live. But friends, tonight, what is truth? You see, the truth is this. You, you, you matter to God. You matter to God. You're important to God. And Jesus said, I come to give you life. Why did he say that? Why did he say that? Because, friends, most people aren't really living life. Let me ask you tonight, are you really living life? Are you? You see, most people aren't really living life. Most people just exist. And there's a tremendous difference between just existing and living life the way God intended you to live life. You see, whenever you exist, you get up in the morning, you go to work, if you're lucky enough, and lucky, forgive me, that's the wrong word to use, but you know my sentiment in that. If you're fortunate enough to still have a job in this economic climate, you get up in the morning, you go to work, you come home, you watch television, you go to bed. You get up the next day, you go to work, you come home, you watch television, you go to bed. Can anybody guess what you do the next day? Yeah. You get up, you go to work, you come home, you watch television you go to bed. I want to ask you tonight, is that life? Is that really living? Friends, surely that's just existing. Just existing. That's just drifting through life aimlessly. No purpose, no significance, 
no importance, just existing from one day to the other. Just taking up the space, so to speak, waiting for the inevitable whenever you'll pass from this scene of time. But Jesus came to show truth. And Jesus came to give real life. Life abundant. Life with all of its fullness. And that's because you're related to God once you receive that life. You're in fellowship with God, your maker and creator, and the God who loves you more than you could ever possibly know. He came to show truth. He came to give real life. And he also came to save and to forgive. Don't be afraid, Joseph, to take Mary as your wife. Because that which is conceived of her is born is of the Holy, Holy Ghost. And then he goes on and he says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sin. Fear not, for behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, Christ the Lord. The one who came to save mankind. The one who came to save not just mankind, but the one who came to save the individual. The one who came to touch your life and to touch your heart personally. The Savior. What do we need a Savior for? Well, friends, heaven's a perfect place. And that means there's not one of us. Not one of us. Not one of us will ever be in heaven. It's a perfect place, and we are completely imperfect in every single way. And so God came to earth. God lived the perfect life. God died upon the cross. God paid for all our imperfections. He paid for all of our sin. He prayed with his own precious blood. And he says, if you will trust in me, if you will trust in Jesus, then God says, I will bring you in, into my family, into my kingdom, into my goodness, into my eternity. And it's all found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who saves from sin. Friends, that's Christmas. That's the miracles of Christmas. I want to say, what a deal that is, eh? What a deal that is. And we never have to pay a penny for it. We never have to do anything to earn it. All we have got to do is respond to his love and say, yes, Lord, I'm a sinner, but I'm asking you, you came to save, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to save me. The night I got saved, that's all I said. Lord, save me. And praise God he did. That's all we have to do. And friends, tonight, surely that's the greatest Christmas gift that was ever, ever offered. The hymn writer says, there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. And so God became flesh. And he grew. And he became a man. And he died upon the cross at Calvary. So that you, dear friend, and I, that us all, with all of our imperfections, so that we could be saved, sins forgiven, receiving this gift, receiving this tremendous deal, and knowing the power of God in our lives, not just for this life, but praise God for all eternity. Now, I'm asking you a question tonight, and I'm finished. I'm asking you this question. There'll be people give you a gift this Christmas. And whenever someone offers you that package, whatever it is, all done up nicely with that Christmas paper, you know, and maybe that wee bow on it, and it looks so good, and you'll take it. They'll offer it to you, and you'll take it. And you'll look at it, and you'll open it. And you'll make the gift your very own. The question I'm asking you tonight is this. What are you going to do with God's gift? 
What are you going to do? God's gift comes packaged as Jesus. That's God's gift. The greatest Christmas gift anybody could get. But whenever someone offers you a present at Christmas, you've got to reach out your hand and take it. And it's exactly the same with this gift of God. He offers Jesus Christ. He offers forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ to every one of us. But you, dear friend, you have got to reach out to him and accept and receive that gift that he's offering to you right now. And so I'm asking you tonight, what are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to accept him? The gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life packaged in Jesus. Are you going to take that tonight, accept that? Or tell me, are you going to go out through that door whenever this service is over? And you're going to say, by doing that, God may offer me anything, but I don't want it. Because you're either going to do one or the other. You're either going to accept his gift, or tonight you're going to say, no, I don't want that. Keep it. And you're going to go out through that door and go home the way you came. The dear one, listen to me. It is our prayer that you will accept God's gift tonight. And if you do, I'm going to tell you that this is going to be the greatest Christmas that you've ever had. Because you've accepted the greatest gift that you could possibly be given. Will you take Jesus? Let's just bow in prayer. I'm not going to prolong the meeting, but as always, I want to give you opportunity to respond in your heart right now to the Lord. To respond to this invitation that he has presented to you tonight. An invitation to receive his gift, the Lord Jesus Christ, and all that he can bring to your life for time and for eternity. Will you turn your back on that or will you turn to him now and say, yes, Lord, I have sinned. But you came into this world to save me from my sin. Lord, save me now. Now you respond, but let me say this very clearly. You will respond tonight one way or the other. But God's a perfect gentleman. And he will never force himself into your heart or life. You have got to open up and reach out to him and accept him. Do that, please. Do it now. Lord, you know every single heart that's bowed before you here this evening. Lord, grant deciding grace. There may be those in this place tonight, Lord, who just don't know you. May this be the very night that they come and accept you, put their trust, put their faith in you, and be born again of your Spirit, washed in your blood, and receive from you that which Jesus our Savior came into this world so long ago just to give. So bless us, Lord, we pray, every life. Move in every heart and save in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen.